Everybody welcome. Uh, I opened the room a little bit late, so I'll just let everyone give a sec to come in. Um, we're going to have a great conversation today with, uh, or I, I say we, every time, they are going to have a great conversation. Um, and uh, Enrique Ode and uh, Zachary Burke and Austin Bryan, some great, great topics and great uh, content they're going to bring you. And I want you to bring them the heat. When it's question time, bring them the questions. Make them work for this, for this speaker session. Really, really bring it to them. Um, so yeah, so again, as, as every session is gone, whether you're joining us from previous sessions or this is your first one, um, the speakers will have an opportunity to share their presentations, kind of really highlight this topic um, as they go into kind of what is Big Bang and they'll, they'll, they'll share their experiences and things like that. We'll also have Q&A time, opportunities for people to ask questions, stuff like that, but always put stuff in chat, put Q&A at any time. They'll watch those. I'll watch those. Make sure your questions get answered. Otherwise, I'm going to turn the time over to Austin Bryan from Defense Unicorns, Zachary Burke from Platform One, and Enrique Ote from Second Front Systems. The floor is yours, gentlemen. All right. I look good, Matt. Are they up? Are they running? Yep, you're good. All right. Uh, I'm going to try to talk and push slides and share the mic. So let's see how this goes today. Um, pleasure for myself to be joined by Zach and Enrique, two guys I've, I've known for a while now. Um, I'm going to introduce myself on the next chart and then let them do the same thing. So I'm not going to hang out on this one much longer. Um, so uh, the running joke right now is this facial hair I'm trying to grow, just so some people on this call might actually know me. Um, it looks hideous, I understand. But one of the things I always try to do is, is not take myself too seriously. Um, so I included some of my awesome November themed photos and who I am. Uh, first and foremost, a father of two young kids, which consumes all my time outside of work. Um, previous to this year, I had been in the Air Force uh, almost 12 years as an active duty officer um, in the acquisition career field as a computer engineer, which really just meant to uh, help the government acquire and build systems. Um, in that time, I worked on the Airborne Laser Program, which was something for Missile Defense Agency. I was a computer engineer working on optics, which made no sense, but I, I learned a lot about learning new things. Um, I then did a stint in the operational side of the Air Force as a space operator um, at the 460th Space Wing, specifically with uh, DSP and SIBRS. Uh, acronyms don't matter. They're things that look for hot things moving across the globe. Um, but got my operational kind of teeth cut there, and I'll, I'll circle back to that at the end of my intro. Um, after that, I, I took a, a green door assignment, which is something where you, you kind of interview for a classified job. I was going to go work on what they call offensive cyber in the Air Force. And of course, I show up in San Antonio about four years ago, almost five years ago now. And they say, never mind, you're going to work on this software factory concept, which I actually blame Enrique for because um, they were like, literally, I was told, hey, San Antonio needs a Kessel run when I showed up. And I didn't, I it was coming out of the operational side of the Air Force. I hadn't done software in four years. I was like, I have no idea what that means, but uh, I'll go figure it out. Um, and they were kind enough to share a lot of information with us. And so I kind of, I helped establish uh, it's kind of a San Antonio software factory scene called Level Up. Um, through that process, I met a lot of uh, other crazy like-minded individuals that kind of sucked me into this platform one movement in the Air Force and on the DOD side. And then uh, this last year in February, um, so almost a year ago now, I um, separated and I've joined Defense Unicorn since then. So I'm no longer an active duty officer. I'm a, I'm a contractor or, you know, kind of software enthusiast at this point. Um, I just really want to share one other thing about myself that the reason I care so much about this problem, and it'll come up later in the, in the overall briefing, is I spent time on the operational side, as I mentioned, um, and it shocked me the first time I was allowed on an operations floor on the kind of classified side after I got read in to see the software that these 18 to 22 year old airmen at the time were operating. Um, it looked like something, I hadn't written software in five years at that point. And it looked like something that I would have touched like in grade school, uh, DOS computers, blue screens. And these people were spending very short amount of time reporting on missile launches. Um, and over the course of that time, we had several different issues. Um, but what I, what I noticed the Air Force did, just my opinion was they, they, were, they were very happy to blame people for, for issues and, and errors on the operation of the Air Force and rarely would blame the system. Um, and in my opinion, the software led them to those errors quite frequently. Um, and ever since then, after I saw people lose stripes or lose their clearances, um, I still think about those things every single day. And I, I just decided that, you know what, changing the way the DOD and other regulated systems get software to the most critical missions is, is the thing that I'm meant to spend my time on. Um, and so those stories stick with me. I'm sure the other these other two guys have great stories too. So I'm gonna pass it over to Enrique. Hey, thanks. Uh, hey, Austin, great to actually see you again. Um, so 
Uh, my background, so as you can see from the wonderful photos, I also was in the Air Force, uh, retired about two years ago, um, and I was a cyber officer and a China foreign area officer. I spent some time in China, speak some Chinese, uh, but my career really was was cyber. Start off, um, for those of you who know me now, they're like, oh my God, that guy's not technical. How can he be, he be a CTO? Uh, for those of you who knew me 25 years ago, I actually was, was doing, did not finish, a master's in computer science. I coded in C, C++, BSD Unix. Um, I was a AOC weapon system administrator back when I was on Solaris, back in the old days, late 90s. That's how old I am. Uh, so I, I do have some technical chops that over my career turned into, hey, how do I find other engineers to do the work for me? Because I don't like coding that much. And so that kind of really led to a lot of the work I did in the in the DoD. I helped stand up uh, the Defense Innovation Unit out in Silicon Valley uh, way back in the day. Ran the Air Force team out there for a while, and then of course uh, started with Kessel Run. So those are, and then, by the way, those two organizations have some of the best wall art in the Department of Defense. So I have the little signs posted up there on the right. Those are actual photos. Uh, yeah, it's my family out on the left. My youngest son followed in my footsteps. He's at the Air Force Academy right now. Uh, yeah, it's an okay school. Um, and then those are my two doggos and those things are, uh, awesome. So, and then you see my wife, unfortunately the kids grew and she is no longer, uh, that tall in relation to, uh, her children. Uh, but that's okay. So, um, I'm excited to be here. You know, my, my journey to this kind of world actually came from the DCGS weapon system where I was so frustrated and how ancient the DCGS weapon system technology was. I was like, can't we do this better? Can't we build it better? And it was kind of that impetus that got me to grab a couple of uh, airmen, uh, bring them out to San Francisco, show them how to code in a commercial manner. And that's really kind of kicked off Kelsa Run. Now, I realized they didn't let me fix a DCGS weapon system, but the Air Force was kind enough to let me try to tackle the AOC weapon system. And so really moving to this world is that same thing. It's like, why are we using such bad software? I've seen people do it better. And I was able to grab some airmen, start off with six of them. And I think by the time I left Kessel Run, we had about 1,200 people in the organization. And so I'm absolutely excited uh, to see how far this is spread around the DOD. So I'll stop there. I'll use Zach. Thank you. Um, so my name is Zachary Burke. Uh, I'm uh, uh, a Platform One employee. Uh, currently, I am the value stream leader of the Iron Bank value stream. Um, and so a little later, we'll get into explaining what the Iron Bank is for everybody. But basically, um, it is our um, certified container repository that you can pull um, hardened containers from. Um, so this is a beautiful picture of myself here. And Austin added, uh, I'm a new dad. So I have a seven month old. Um, his name's Casper. Um, so I'm going through the rapid aging experience here right now. Um, uh, while I go on the journey of new dadhood um, and raising my son, which is an amazing experience um, uh, and comes highly recommended for me if you have the opportunity to become a dad. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's been a tremendous joy. Um, and so a little bit about me and how I ended up here with this cadre of good people. Um, I went to school for finance. Um, that's uh, a passion of mine is, uh, you know, monetary systems and how it is that you administer, um, you know, large, uh, I guess, swaths of data and organize that and pay for things, right? I'm kind of like a I enjoy bean counting um, and the systems that enable you to do that. And so I kind of found myself working in businesses um, that used antiquated systems, kind of like what Austin was talking about with not a lot of innovation, right? Accounting systems really haven't changed um, much. I mean, the system of accounting itself has been around since we used to use gold coins. It's, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years old. Um, and th there's really not a lot of innovation there. And so kind of observing some of these problems, you know, in the workplace, I used to work at a construction company um, called American Bridge. Um, uh, I just kind of got involved and started solving some of these accounting challenges that we had to automate, um, you know, processes. And so automating things is like a universal skill that can be applied across a lot of different um, work, you know, work competencies, right? And so we had a lot of 
uh, paper checks, you know, getting mailed around the country to like actually pay for things. And so we automated all of that. So there's no more paper flying around through the mail all over the world to um, request money and then receive money. Um, and it saved the organization millions of dollars and sped up, you know, project deliverables and kept a lot of stuff on track. There's a lot of positive stories to that. And so uh, working on automation, I developed a passion for that and how it is that that can affect the scalability of businesses and how they can compete, um, you know, in marketplaces around the world. We, uh, and that is kind of the journey I went on to end up here. I ended up getting into consulting and started teaching businesses how it is that you can be more competitive and use automation to um, drive your competitive advantage uh, in marketplaces that are becoming increasingly more competitive, including the one that we're in, um, you know, here at the Air Force, we compete um, in, you know, various different swim lanes. And so I had heard um, that there was an initiative here, like the countercultural movement to um, make the Air Force more competitive and kind of flip the pancake on how we do things. Um, and that initiative was called Platform One, um, you know, which we'll all talk about here uh, during our presentations. Um, and uh, I talked to Mr. Austin Bryan here, you know, he hired me into this um, fantastic group of people and I've been loving my life ever since. Um, and so that's a little bit about me. Um, and I'm really excited to be speaking with you all today. Thanks, Zach. Uh, Zach made the mistake of refusing to provide me pictures for his uh, slide, so I made it up for him. Uh, he's lucky there wasn't more memes because I could have went a lot deeper in that hole. Um, okay, I'm going to talk for a bit, uh, but uh, Enrique or, or Zach, if you have things to say, please just hop off the mic and interrupt me. Um, I wanted to start because there's a this is an intro course and the concepts of Kubernetes and secure software delivery and automation, agile, DevSecOps, all the fun buzzwords gets pretty deep, pretty fast. Um, so I wanted to start off with, with why and what things are before we kind of talk uh, deeply about Big Bang. And I think uh, Big Bang is this software baseline, and I'll get to what it is in a second. But first, I wanted to start off like, why, why does it matter to deliver software securely? Because that's really what Big Bang was created for. Um, these are things that I, I firmly believe, and I think the other gentlemen on the call with me do as well, that I kind of developed uh, through the, my time at Platform One. But I think, you know, as, as our nation tries to protect itself strategically, um, we're, we're probably headed for another conflict at some point in time, and we're always worried about that, at least from the Department of Defense perspective, right? And so I kind of summarize, like, what does secure software have to do with the big picture of, of defending and protecting the nation? Well, first of all, um, I think it keeps our assets ready. I have no doubt that the next time we're in some sort of kinetic conflict, that there will be many assets that are rendered useless because they are taken out before things actually go kinetic because they were exploited. And so there's this first concept of like secure software delivery matters because of just straight up cybersecurity and the posture of the software that we're operating. Um, the second is maybe my favorite of the four, which I've seen happen when I was in the Air Force, which is one of the coolest things I've ever seen, which is we can take things that operators currently have in deployed areas and change the way they fundamentally operate uh, based on real-time feedback. If you can do continuous delivery securely, you can actually change capabilities in the hands of operators, right? Because software on running on a piece of hardware, even in somebody's hands, um, can, can actually change their capabilities based on feedback you're getting. Um, and, and a continuous delivery method actually allows you to do that. The third one is we can actually deliver new things faster, like net new completely, new weapon systems, whatever it is. Um, if you follow along how long it takes to acquire things in the government, there's a, a billion different reasons we could talk about of why it's super slow. But a lot, one of the key reasons is um, we're redoing software tech stacks over and over and over again from the scratch when there's actually a lot of reuse. And so continuous software delivery actually lets us do more rapid prototyping, get feedback faster, deliver new capabilities faster. Um, and then finally, this is one I've become more passionate about maybe since I left the government almost a year ago now, which is, you know, the government used to lead the conversation um, in technology with industry. Um, that's gone away over the last 60 to 70 years, in my in my own opinion. And there's this giant gap between the, and actually Enrique was heavily involved in this, so I'm interested if you have any comments on it. But, you know, there's this giant gap in all this net new innovation and talent base that exists in our country Uh and a lot of them are uninterested or unable or don't want to work with government. And so we, we have all these capabilities we need. And instead of doing it ourselves on the government side, we could just tap into that innovation, uh, especially in the software world where software now is eating everything. 
but we can't tap into it for a number of different uh, barriers, some cybersecurity, some aqua, some contracting, some funding. There's a lot of reasons, but but being able to deliver software securely actually allows you to tap into that more rapidly and, and bridges that gap between government and industry. And Enrique, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything before. Bond. I definitely do because I'm going to disagree with what you just said. I actually don't think that the industry doesn't want to work with the government. They want to work with the government. The government makes it so hard to work with the government. It's just not cost effective. Their investors won't back it. Um, it's it is not worth their time to have to deal with government regulations and policies in this regard. And so anything that can be done to make that go faster on the security side, contract side, uh, software side, it makes it easier. But like, it's incredible how many people want to work with the government. Uh, the government just has to make it better and has to make it easier. So, yeah, good point. The entry barriers need to be much lower than they are today. Right. Um, okay. So we're going to jump in. That's like the why I want to jump in a little bit about what is big bang at a very, very high level. Um, you'll hear it marketed as a, a DevSecOps platform. And what it really is, is a set of configuration as code um, that deploys kind of a core cybersecurity stack. And I'll, I'll, I'll peel this onion back a little further as I go. Uh, but I'm very much a visual learner, so I wanted to show it in a picture first. Um, for those familiar with computer science or software, computer engineering, that there's this OSI model of different layers that you have to kind of stretch across from networking to application and data to, to deliver some sort of software capability. Um, Big Bang is actually a very narrow slice across kind of the middle. That's why it gets called a platform a lot. But even the words infrastructure and platform get used somewhat interchangeably depending on who you're talking to. Um, and th that's why I wanted to start here. In this specific case, right, there is some sort of either cloud service provider or on-prem hardware stack. Um, and then typically on top of that, there's some sort of operating system and orchestration tool or virtual machine that sits on top of that that orchestrates the hardware. That's actually all not what Big Bang touches at all. Um, it assumes that that stuff exists somewhere in your production or, or development systems. And then it layers on kind of about a dozen different applications that it, it makes up of a platform. Um, that platform was specifically designed to uh, functionally implement the DevSecOps reference architecture that the DoD wrote. Um, and Platform One built this system so that other people don't have to start and go meet that reference architecture by themselves from day one to kind of accelerate again, delivering net new things and letting them start. You know, instead of starting from square one, maybe they're starting from square four out of 10. Um, it's not a one all stop shop to fix everything, but it does definitely add and accelerate capability. Um, then it also has on top of that cybersecurity layer, there's a bunch of, there's an entire ecosystem that I'm sure, you know, Zach will talk more about where they've added a bunch of things that integrate with that cybersecurity stack that are actually more end user facing applications that you can benefit from day one, making it feel like a SaaS or a software as a service, um, even though it's, it's not right. It's actually deployed on-prem somewhere managed by not the commercial company who created the software to begin with. Um, and so I wanted to kind of show where it lives. And then in addition to that, right, you actually can have other third-party developers, like we talked about between us and commercial industry, put additional capabilities integrated with that sidecar, like the kind of sidecar stack, so that you can deliver net new things along with whatever platform one provides. And again, that's kind of the point I made earlier about closing that gap between industry and government so we can tap into some of that innovation and capability. Um, okay, so what? So how does Big Bang help, right? Uh, I kind of hit on it, but I want to get more specific. Um, many government programs are operating disparate tech stacks. Uh, there's, a, there's a reason for that, uh, and I'm sure Enrique has a more unique and more experience on this topic than I do, but I'll share my opinion first and let Enrique chime in too. You know, the way funding is kind of given to leaders and incentivized is you kind of at these different operational levels, you have somebody in charge of a budget, let's call it 60 to $80 million, whatever it may be. And they're told, hey, go build an entire system from nothing, right? When there's net new capability being delivered. The first thing you typically have to do, especially if it's software based is go create, you know, go find a cloud service provider or on-prem stacks, again, depending on classification, um, and go start building out that OSI tech stack I mentioned. And a lot of those people are left to start from square one every single time. And when you do that, you what you end up with is like, you know, whatever, the, however big the DOD budget is, you have all these 60 to $80 million chunks that have all built their own silo. And that becomes a problem because none of those silos are built to talk or integrate with each other because of, of how that kind of the money flows. And Enrique, before I move on to the next pain point, maybe you want to add anything there? Yeah, I do. And actually, I'll, I'll give a quick history lesson. So uh, back in the old days, we're talking like 2015, 2016, as we stood up the Defense Innovation Unit at Silicon Valley, one of the issues we had is we found this really awesome tech. And then you try to bring it into the DOD and 
the company's like, well, we run on the cloud. And the DoD answer is, well, we have Dis's Mill Cloud. Yeah. And it didn't work. Like for, for a lot of technical reasons, you just couldn't run this commercial tech on the Dis and Mill Cloud. It wasn't the same as commercial cloud. And so we started saying, okay, well, how do we move this stuff out of commercial clouds? But then you start running into the issue, which is what I think we'll get into more is like, how did Big Bang help with this is a lot of people in the DoD did not have the expertise to first of all, configure the infrastructure, configure uh, the, a platform layer on top of that infrastructure, or even have the expertise to make the right technical choices about well, what should be in that stack. And so one of the aspects of Big Bang that I kind of like is for, you don't have to make those choices. Some basic choices are there. So if you just want to get started, there's now something that it works. The software is approved. The software has been in use by others. You know it's going to meet the mission need. Now, as you get more sophisticated, as you get better, you can make different choices. But if you're going to start somewhere, that's a place to start. Because when we started five, six years ago, we didn't even have a starting point. We were literally just trying to figure out how we run this stuff the way the commercial sector runs. Because most of us came out of the old sysad world of, I'm just going to spin up Linux on some hardware and I'm going to install and configure everything myself from scratch, then maybe do some cloning of hard drives. But, you know, we're we are trained in the duty in old school sysad work. This takes you to the next level. And for people who do not have that, you know, you don't have anything pre-built, this is a good pre-built, gets you going, the stuff, you know, the stuff's going to work. And so, yeah. Yeah, and, and you, you nailed my second point already, so I won't hit it again, but it's, you know, the expertise and, and keeping it there is difficult, right? So you have people making those decisions and it's not their fault. It's not a knock at them. They're just not trained in those things, right? And then, yeah, they're, they're left there to make those decisions. Uh, and then kind of my last point is a lot of these tech that gets created, you know, 70, 80%, I mean, it's not a hard and fast number because it depends on every system, but most of it is actually overlapping. Like they're doing the same thing over and over again. Um, and so it just gets, it just becomes waste in a system, right? And so really the, the two points I want to drive home is the kind of the unique challenge in the government space in general is there's diverse infrastructure, right? Because of these different people making decisions at different decentralized levels, there's not like, it's not like Google or Apple building one baseline where they, their developers know the production environment they're deploying to. It could be that their software or data has to go to multiple different points that they can't plan for up front. Um, so that diversity in infrastructure is one of the major challenges. And the second one, which we haven't hit on yet, but I do want to add is this idea of authorization officials and authorization boundaries. Um, so the way that a lot of government works is you have to accredit a system, which is really an audit of cybersecurity compliance to say that, hey, my data is going to be protected to the level that I need it protected. And if I want to talk to somebody else's system, typically they were authorized by two separate people. And if they are, those two people who accept some sort of risk now have to agree to connect their systems because that you open a threat vector by connecting it externally to somebody else. Um, and so the other kind of challenge in the government space is this idea of accreditation and compliance um, and getting these you know, different individuals who are accepting risk because it's, it's, there's this system called Risk Management Framework or RMF backed by NIST who creates a bunch of controls. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it all comes down to risk acceptance and mitigation. That's why it's called Risk Management Framework. Um, and so risk is different to every single person, just like you manage your finances differently than every single person, right? Everybody has different risk tolerances and it becomes really difficult to take software data in one system and move it to another. Even if it functionally works, the people who are accepting risk may not have the same level of risk tolerance and would stop it from happening anyways. And so that creates, you know, kind of a second major barrier that I want to dive into with Big Bang next. Um, so on the right, you will see a very outdated picture of Big Bang. I apologize, my own apologies, because that's the most recent one I had. And I purposely left the release version in there. So people that are really following along with Big Bang can go look in repo one. Uh, maybe maybe Rob Slaughter or Zach or somebody can drop the, the Big Bang project link in there. They can go look at the documentation themselves. So I don't want to get people hung up on the details of like, this is exactly it, because it's probably changed wildly uh, since I pulled this picture months and months, maybe even a year ago, quite frankly. Uh, but what I wanted to get to is that the picture you saw previously said, hey, this is Big Bang Core and this is Big Bang add-ons. That's the gray and green layers you see on the right. And then the, the orange and blue on the top is the different ecosystem of applications that have started to integrate and work with the government on this common baseline. Um, again, it has changed now, but what Big Bang really helps you do is attack uh, basically the two problems I brought up. The first one, which is this diverse infrastructure a lot of that is actually handled by Kubernetes and the movement from the commercial and open source world. Um, for those that don't know what Kubernetes is, it's a container orchestration platform. Um, 
It's not super important, but think of it how different software talks to the hardware stack. There's a way to very intelligently orchestrate that across multiple resources. Um, it was started by Google under a different name and then they open sourced it. And now it's this giant community and ecosystem that things uh, interact with it. Um, so it's kind of the widely accepted way to do cloud native software at this point, um, kind of from an operating system or kind of core platform technology. Uh, but one of the good things that Kubernetes allows people, including the government, to do is to actually move to different diverse sets of infrastructure, right? Because it, it has its own API. You can talk to it from the application layer and stay consistent. Um, for example, the government has to worry about problems of, hey, I started in Azure, but for some contractual or business reason, I need to move to Amazon. Well, if you've chosen a bunch of Azure native things, this is not at Microsoft, I'm not trying to promote or not promote either company, um, you'll have a problem transitioning to a different one, right? And it creates different business case problems um, for people making those decisions. And so what you can do is you can stay API compliant with Kubernetes at the platform layer, and you can actually move around to different infrastructures. And so getting back to like, hey, we have this massive diverse infrastructure problem, um, Kubernetes itself, nothing specific to the government has really helped solve that. And that's it really more for the government means staying modern with the, the rest of the world since like 2014 of slowly migrating to Kubernetes matters because that's what the rest of industry is doing. So if you want to tap into industry, you need to follow along with the software architecture that they're, they're going with. Um, so the second one is really more, the second problem I brought up with this idea of multiple security boundaries and different risk tolerance tolerances is, is really the problem Big Bang, in my opinion, was set to attack. Hey, if I have a reference architecture that says this is what good cybersecurity looks like functionally, right? It stays agnostic to tools. Um, if I create a baseline as the DOD that can implement those functions and I make it, I'll, I'll call it DOD open source, DOD available on, on repo one, which is a, a platform one run repository, um, then I can just go pull it as a government customer and use it. And I, I now have the same cybersecurity posture if I stay up to date with my software as you do. Uh, and what that really means is I can now tell the people that are accepting different risks in two systems, if you're running the same sidecar security or cybersecurity stack, there is a large overlap in cyber cybersecurity capability. Now I might not have to refactor or go through this reaccreditation thing. And it may sound very minimal, but it's actually a very complex problem to manage. Um, because of that, really, it comes down to this trust aspect of different people accepting risk. And so really wanted to focus on Big Bang Core and attacking that second problem of crossing AO boundaries, because it could become a point where, hey, Enrique at Kessel Run created this awesome application that I at Platform One want to run, but we have different AOs and I can't take Enrique's data nor the application because my AO says, well, I don't like the way you deploy your software, the way you built your software. Um, you can get away from a lot of that when you start standardizing around the right layers uh, of a platform. Um, and that's really what Big Bang's focused on. Um, and so what, what you're going to hear us transition to with the last, I think we have 50 minutes to talk. So we have like another 24 minutes. Uh, the three of us will be chatting about like Big Bang does a lot. Um, and it's a very good start to like kind of the whole value stream delivery of software. It plays a very critical role, but it's not everything. Um, and it's not created to be everything. Uh, and so you're going to hear each of the three of us uh, talk about like, well, what do you do with Big Bang after that? How do you take Big Bang and turn it into a full value delivery for a customer? And there's a number of different ways to do that. Um, and, and they all add different parts of value to different parts of the kind of market that we're trying to address. Um, so the remaining challenges that I've always seen with Big Bang are, are really threefold. Um, and we kind of, and Enrique actually hit on this a little bit earlier. Uh, the government HR process makes it extremely difficult to not only, uh, actually they do a decent job at attracting great software minds, uh, but it makes it really hard to develop and retain them just based on how they manage their HR system. And I, I won't get into the specifics because that's not the goal of this talk, but it, it's important because the person operating the software, you have to make, you can't make certain assumptions about them based on the talent that they are able to acquire and retain. Um, the second one is, is Big Bang. I, I've made it sound maybe simple on this talk, but it's, it's not, I, I'm not a software, a real software engineer anymore. Uh, but managing a dozen or more upstream software, especially open source products, taking ownership of their CVE posture, doing the continuous deployment of it, doing the integration. Uh, as you think about integration points in any system engineering problem, the more integrations, the more complex a system. Um, that gets even harder with things you can't see, like software. Um, so keeping Big Bang up to date in and of itself and maintained well, which Platform One does a great job of, is already a huge lift and burden. Uh, but it's still a complex piece of software on the other side uh, when you when you inherit it and try to run it yourself. Um, and then the last one I'll mention, which is is probably obvious to people, but I don't want it to go unstated, is 
the people that are operating these different weapon systems, and I show, I just pulled some examples, right, between like missile, space, and sea for like they for people that haven't been in the military before in the specific instance, which uh, a lot of us on this call probably have, is the, the operator is trained to operate a specific system. And those people are usually 18 to 25 years old, and they're experts in that system. They are not trained to be experts in software development, software operations. Like that's a part of their job, yes, inherently by the specific weapon system they created. But you, when you create something as complex as Big Bang or any other complex software, you can assume that some sort of SRE or, or you know Google level SRE is on the other side ready to catch your software. That's just not the case. And it shouldn't be the case. And so one of the issues with Big Bang and what you'll see the three of us talk about is like, how do you make the, the experience of using it and running it as easy as possible? So reducing that complexity and cognitive load for the operator. Um, so I'm gonna hit on how to fix. Yeah, go ahead. Also, before you jump to this next one, can I real quick comment on something? Uh, if you go back to your the Big Bang's tech stack, because I saw some questions on the side about reciprocity and accreditation and things like that. So one of the things that uh, I like about Big Bang, it, it has to do with the idea of uh, runtime security and observability. As you start looking through the DevSecOps reference design, you look at the, the continuous ATO uh, methodology that was signed out by DOD CIO this year. What we're, we're going into a world where accreditation is not about, is your software secure? Like, is your the app itself secure? That's old school. You pen tested an app, you're like, oh, now it's on an approved product list. That's not how the world works because risk is not just the at the application layer. Risk is inherited for the methodology in which that software is run. And so when you look at the new guidance coming out, so much of it has to do with continuous monitoring, observability, incident response. And so when you start looking at Big Bang, what you have down at that Big Bang core layer, and it's mentioned on this on here, is that cybersecurity stack. Uh, we personally, my company, we're using the low, uh, the low key prompt tail. Uh, we have Istio. We have a few of the other monitoring tools in there. And so the idea is what makes this the reciprocity work is not so much that I'm securing a piece of hardware than throwing it over the fence of some other person. It's the idea that you're securing a piece of hardware, but it's running in an infrastructure that is monitored so that the AO has full visibility and full faith in the fact that if something does happen, you're going to see it. You're not just doing like an ACAS scan once every two years. Now, there's an education piece that goes with this, educating the AOs on the idea of continuous monitoring and, and continuous feedback uh, and observability. That's something new. They're used to big stacks of paper every couple of years, but this it's getting there. You're seeing a lot more people picking this up. And so that's where I think the stack and the visibility of the stack gives you actually helps with those accreditation pieces as DOD CIO is moving towards this new concept of accreditation. Yeah, I appreciate that, Enrique. I haven't been watching the chat because I've been doing most of the talking. So I think thanks for addressing those. Yeah, I, I've been ignoring your talk and I'm just watching the chat. So it's cool. <laughs> uh, thanks. Yeah, uh, we're, we're a good team. I, I'll just add on that by saying like th there's a lot of, you know, for me, I always compartmentalize things as like Lego blocks and how they work together. I really think of the, the secure runtime environment as one piece, but there's also the delivery mechanism, which it becomes the dev platform and the CI capabilities that kind of the two things have to go together for a full life cycle of security. And that's really what continuous ATO gets after. Um, but Enrique did a great job of explaining it. It's just really not like a, it's a big evolution forward from like a point in time, every two to three years scan with one cybersecurity tool and like send that report off to somebody and see what comes back. It's a, it's definitely like a, a full-time visibility and transparency exercise at this point. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna jump into defense unicorn specific stuff then pass it to Enrique and uh, Zach to do the same for their organizations. Um, one of the things we, we've tried to address with defense unicorns is, is going back to some of those, like what, what's next with Big Bang once you, ha you get this product from platform one um, and specifically looking at um, this the diverse infrastructure and develop, and I will call it the, the user experience aspect of, of leveraging Big Bang. Um, so, so Zarf is an open source product that Defense Unicorns maintains. Um, the link right there is on the slides to GitHub, and I, I believe the slides are all downloadable and shared from, from uh, Matt and crew from this. And our link to our website that talks about it uh, way more is also there, so people can do kind of self-research if they're interested or reach out to myself or others. Um, uh, you can see kind of the support, you know, why we are the maintainers, there are 34 other contributors and a lot of different activity and people adopting at this point. But the whole idea behind Zarf was how do I make sure that I can repeatedly and securely and automate the deployment of Big Bang? There's parts of that that work already internal to Big Bang of connecting the pieces, but how do you connect it to the rest of the vertical stack to different infrastructures is then the problem. 
And then you'll see for the air gap is a key value proposition. Um, I, I liked, instead of air gap, I sometimes like to use the word egress limited, which just means like outbound communication from the system, because uh, a lot of things that federally regulated market does is not fully air gap from the internet, but it is what I'll call egress limited, meaning like a lot of software, when you build it from a cloud native world that you take from open source or, or industry, it assumes that it can call back to certain places over the internet or over other secure means. But a lot of the systems that the Fed, that, that are federally regulated, whether that be defense, um, financial, energy, whatever, it actually doesn't allow you to just reach out to whatever you want. And what you see is that the software actually won't function when you put it into an air gap or quasi air gapped environment. Um, so Zarf is what it really does is it bundles up every single dependency you could possibly have at the development and build process. It brings it back into production with you and rebuilds itself and re-internalizes how to communicate back and forth so that you don't have those external calls anymore. Um, and that becomes critical when you're building and deploying systems. And so some of the specific features we have listed there that I'll just hit on real quick and pass it to Enrique is, is one, it's completely open source, right? If you have, if your team has the capability to use it and contribute to it, like we love that. We, we love to tap into that innovation and adoption. Um, you can go out there. There's nothing stopping you from using it today. No license fees, anything like that. Um, it's distro agnostic. So there's a hundred different flavors, I feel like, of Kubernetes at this point. Um, Zarf doesn't assume, you know, Rancher Federal. It doesn't assume EKS from Amazon. It doesn't care, right? It just assumes that you want to deploy the Kubernetes and it will be agnostic to that. Um, one of the things you learn about packaging up for air gap by taking all your dependencies with you is it becomes really, really good. And actually, maybe our developers intended this. I'd have to ask Jeff, but I didn't understand this, you know, six months ago, but it makes you really good at software bill of materials, which is an executive order from President Biden, um, knowing what's actually in your supply chain. Uh, when you package up dependencies and take it to a classified environment, you actually know everything you brought. So it, it creates a very strong S-bomb compared to other things I've seen. Um, it installs very easily going back to that experience of how do you lower the barrier to actually using things like Big Bang. It installs with two commands and deploys itself, which makes it super easy for, for others to learn. Um, it consistently deploys, the, the how it deploys to different environments is consistent regardless of where it's going. And then it's self, uh, kind of back to the air gap part, it's self hosts, right? It has its own host and Git server internal to when it stands itself up so that you again can point locally to things that you had to bring with that, rather than going back to the source or external across the internet, which is not allowed in an air gap environment. So I uh, encourage people if they have questions about Zarf. Uh, I think Rob Slaughter, our CEO for my company is hanging out in the chat. I'm sure he's answering all those questions or I'm happy to answer them too as I pass it over to Enrique. Okay. Uh, hey, thanks. So real quick, I'll go real quick this. I'd rather just answer questions on the chat. So um, uh, second front, we built a product called Game Warden. Uh, we did build this on the Big Bang tech stack. So this is one of the things where as a company, when we decided how we're going to build out our capabilities, uh, we chose Big Bang as that platform which to build on top of. A couple of reasons. One, it had the tools we needed. Second, we knew for a path to accreditation, it was the quickest path because there is a comfort level in the DoD on the Big Bang stack. It's been tested out. It's been pen tested. It's been proven. Uh, what we provide is we try to help commercial tech get into the DoD by reducing that friction. At the end of the day, accrediting officials don't want to accredit hundreds of apps. They don't have the time. There's not enough accrediting officials. And the commercial companies, you know, about half of them don't understand how to get accredited. And so we provide that kind of, I'll call a middleware layer. We provide a managed platform that we can take in your software, scan it, hard it, secure it, run it, uh, and make it available uh, in basically running an inherited security model between our already accredited networking infrastructure and platform layer. Uh, and then the AO sets the guardrails of what the software has to look like. So again, if anyone wants to reach out to me, uh, I'll drop my email in the chat here. Oh, it looks like Rob just dropped uh, our website. There you go. Hit our website, reach out to us. If you're trying to get into the DoD and you don't want to run your own Big Bang stack because it is, uh, as we mentioned before, sometimes a little hard to set it up. If you're really awesome, set, set up your own. If you want something uh, a little more turnkey, uh, come talk to us. We'd be happy to try to host your stuff, get you accredited inside the DoD. Stop there. Yeah, it's a really great point. What makes it kind of fun to brief together. Zarf is more about packaging it up and taking something like Big Bang or other with you so you can run it. And this is more of like a, a SaaS operating of it's operating for you, right? So very different ways to implement Big Bang. So, all right, Zach, your turn. Oh, heck yeah. Um, well, everybody, um, let's talk about uh, what I'm here to talk about is Party Bus, right? And how does that, we're here to talk about Big Bang. So why am I talking about Party Bus? What, is, what does this mean? So Party Bus is the platform one service offering that we provide 
um, to the DOD community or really any federal agency that wants to consume Big Bang as a service. So we operate a Big Bang uh, environment um, and we provide this to anyone that wants to consume this as a service because operating Big Bang, um, it's not easy. Um, and it takes a lot of different skill sets that you know need to be acquired and trained um, to operate this program, this platform at a you know, a level of competence that's going to uh, be compliant with all of the different guidance that's coming out of um, the federal government and the DOD um, CIO's office. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later in this, you know, how it is that this helps you stay compliant. But what we're looking at in front of us is a very basic overview of what Partybus is doing for you. Um, and so on the left side of this slide, you see that this process starts with people, right, and collaboration and making something, right? So you need to get inside of our chat ops communities, right, and communicate with users and build something useful for them, right, which is what an application is. It's something to solve a problem for users. You do that inside of a chat ops application that we host called Mattermost. Um, and Mattermost enables you to connect and share um, information and feedback with um, uh, your own internal development teams, your external users, other teams that are doing the exact same thing inside of the Department of Defense. Um, you have access to any, any other chat ops community that's inside of this platform um, using party bus and platform one services uh, right along with us. And so um, once you've come up with an idea, right? You need to start deploying this into production. You know, you're using our GitLab service. That's our uh, repository of choice right now. Um, and, you know, you code your application. And what PartyBus is going to enable you to do is commit that code into a pipeline that we have built out for you, right? So when you contract with us, we sit down, we build you out a pipeline specifically for what it is that you want to do. And we put that inside of our CATO'd um, DevSecOps environment, which we call our DSOP environment. And there's two, there's a couple of things about this that's important. One, you're natively consuming Big Bang if you're inside of DSOP um, and you're always on the latest release of all of the software components that um, Big Bang is comprised of. And every container that we use is also hosted inside of Iron Bank. So you're using DOD best practices um, to actually harden the containerized infrastructure that your platform is running on. So these are two great services that you're using natively. You don't even have to think about it. Whenever you're using a party bus service, we do all of that thinking for you. Um, I have some questions here. Let me slow down a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm trying to help answer them. I'll, I'll do the conclusion stuff too, Zach, or do you want to answer them at that point? Okay, sure. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do that at the end. The chat's moving a little too fast for me. Um, so, uh, the environment, right? It's CTF or it's a CATO, right? Continuous authority to operate. Um, that's a really important um, thing to talk about. We'll go into more details there um, in my next slide, what that means. But this little box here is a very important box and it adds a lot of value um, to our consumers and it solves a lot of problems um, and speeds up getting your application into production, which is what our goal. We want to enable you to focus as much as possible on delivering the value to your consumer, right? Which may be a warfighter, it may be somebody in support services inside of the government, which by nature of their existence in this ecosystem is supporting a warfighter, right? That that should be your that should be your focus, not reading through hundreds of pages of documentation about how it is that you do nerd stuff, right? That's what I do, right? That's what I'm passionate about. That's what I want to do for you and do that at scale. Um, and so that's what Party Bus is trying to do is we want to interpret this information for you and give you a product as a service that you can consume that, you know, doesn't check all the boxes, right? Because we don't like box checking here at Platform One. We're actually doing the things and we're doing the things continuously. Um, and we're constantly abreast of all of the latest um, and greatest things being pushed out of, um, uh, you know, the upper echelons of the government. And sometimes we kind of influence what it is that they push out. Um, I think they're trying to emulate what it is that we're doing because 
some we're ahead of the policy, I think, in a, a lot of different instances of what it is that we do. Um, uh, and I think one of those instances is the zero trust architecture that we had. This architecture was stood up before the government ever released standards on how it is that you do zero trust architecture. And this, uh, the, the zero trust package that you get inside of Party Bus makes you um, completely compliant with zero trust architecture from an infrastructure standpoint. Um, zero trust, um, I don't know if anyone's aware of this, but there's the new... Um, guidelines and roadmap to how it is that you can get your applications and your program to a state of zero trust that just came um, out of the DOD. It was signed by the um, um, Secretary of Defense's office, I think just a couple of days ago, November 22nd is when it came out. And so that's it's a 30 some page document, which is guidance on, you know, you have to do zero trust now. We can't just talk about it anymore. Literally everybody has to do that. So if you have an application, um, you you now need to start thinking about zero trust. A really easy way for you to get zero trust today is, you know, put that application into Party Bus. Um, so let's talk about um, CATO. What is this? Continuous authorities to operate. Uh, to my knowledge, there's two. I have one inside of Party Bus. Enrique has one inside of Game War. And so um, from the CATO memo that came out, you know, there's these bullet points here that says what it is that you need to do to have a CATO and you need to um, constantly be performing uh, cybersecurity activities, which we are, you know, every single day. Um, and you need to adopt the DevSecOps reference design, which both of our platforms have done. Um, and so uh, these uh, key documents which are guiding how it is that you should, the, the best practices for how it is that you deploy software um, inside of the government in secured uh, environments um, are pretty complex. And there's a lot of cognitive load to, um, you know, us, including anyone else that wants to adopt these things. Um, and so one of the main benefits of a CEATO environment is that the environment already exists and it's approved, right? You don't have to come up with a plan and spend 12 months figuring out what it is that you want to do and document how it is that you're going to do it and send that documentation to an AO and then have it bounce back to you because it's missing certain portions of whatever, right? That This stuff already exists. Like if you um, hear of a CATO environment, that environment has all of the components that it needs to be approved indefinitely because we are continuously evaluating all of the um, uh, guidelines that come out of the government and we're continuously implementing fixes to those guidelines inside of the environments, given the feedback that we get from, you know, end user communities, right? Active incidents and then, you know, policy makers that are telling us what, you know, they'd like to see us do um, to make the environments more secure. And so well, why am I talking to you about this? This brings you a tremendous amount of value because if you get into a system like platform one, right? You could choose to take Big Bang, right? Deploy it on your own, or you can come get help with that. And on day one, you would have all these things. You would be doing DevOps on day one. You don't have to read a book. You don't have to wrap your mind around it. Like you're literally doing DevOps day one by participating in our community um, and, and getting involved in chat ops with us. Um, you also have zero trust day one. Um, when your application is inside of this environment, you know, you're protected um, with, you know, multiple layers of, uh, you know, different zero trust security technologies that are all integrating together to give you this zero trust ecosystem. Um, you, you know, you're also getting active cyber defense day one, you know, all of our traffic is being hunt, hunted and pecked through, um, you know, regularly that systems of, you know, data transfer um, and integration with those types of teams is, is very laborious. And so um, getting involved in a CATO environment, uh, you know, gives you that, which would take an extremely long amount of time for you to do on your own. Also, we can get you a Hello World application on day one going to a production site. I, I, I want to find out who else in the government is able to do that. I don't think anybody, I think this is the only place you could get that done um, on day one. Um, and you're also compliant day one too, which is awesome. Um, next slide. I think 
I think that's it. Uh, thanks, Zach. I think for the sake of time, I'm just going to skip the conclusion and say thank you. <laughs> um, I think some of us will be popping in and around industry day tomorrow and gather. Um, yep, go ahead, Enrique. 20-second uh, plug. Um, what makes this work is the fact that Big Bang's constantly involving, as Zach has mentioned. And this is a community, as Zach also mentioned. What that means is if you're out there, you're listening, get involved contribute back to the stack, contribute back to the community. My team's done it. I know a lot of other teams out there have done it. Let, that's what makes us better. That's what makes it evolve. That's what makes it keep up with, with the, the best standards. So you know, again, like Zach said, this is a community. Get involved in that community. Yeah. Amen. Thanks, Enrique. Um, uh, Matt, I, I'm pass it back to you. I think we're out of time. So. All right. What a great session. I'm clapping. I hope everybody else is clapping. Like we're in on stage in presence. And Gerald, we got feedback that I wasn't being festive enough. So Gerald, this is for you. Um, I've got my Christmas jacket out. Um, so yeah, great session, um, wonderful topics, great conversation in the chat. These gentlemen will be around, like they said, around industry day. They're all also active on LinkedIn too. Um, the lobby that you've gone through to get to this session has their LinkedIn. You can connect with them, has their contact information. Um, Austin, do you have the do you have a slide, another slide, or is this it? Um, okay, perfect. I was gonna have them take a screenshot of your contact info, but you didn't give it. But it's okay. They can uh they can get it from me, they can get it from the lobby and the sessions. And us, we'll make sure we do that in the after actions. Um, so really thank you, gentlemen, and thanks for the great topics, conversations. Um, as, as we have this whole time, we're gonna go um, here in a few minutes. We'll start the next session. Um, it's going to be a wonderful conversation on supply chain security with Russ Anderson and John Speed Myers. So we'll leave this room open for a minute. If you guys wanna say thank you, chat with these gentlemen for a second. But uh, feel free to join the other session. We'll start that at the top of the hour, which for me is 11 o'clock mountain time. So make that time adjustment depending on where you are in the world. So really thank you everyone's participation. Um, Austin, Zach, Enrique, y'all killed it. Thank you. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks, good to see everybody. Yeah. Some nice familiar names on there. Um, day two slides for download. Great question, uh, Jason. They, they are in the lobby session. So if you go back to the lobby and you actually click on this session and you scroll down, um, you should see the slides. You will have to refresh if you haven't refreshed today because we just loaded them about an hour ago. Um, so make sure you refresh. If you can't get to them, please message me and we'll make sure we get them to you. Great question. Yeah, Shay said you have to close, might have to close and reopen if not running in the browser. Great session. You want to get a Lego suit? Yeah, I need to get a Lego suit. Um, I got lots of Legos. I got these new Lego markers. They like connect to each other. I don't know the purpose other than ridiculousness. They just kind of like I think you know like write with two of them at the same time. Excellent. Well, uh, yeah, it looks like everyone's jumping to the next session. So um, thanks all. You all obviously you're welcome to enjoy it. Stay if you want, but um, have a great day. Right, thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Yep. Bye, everybody. Thanks, thanks guys. Great question, Michael Snyder at the end there. Hey, Michael, you still there? You copy? Do you know Mike Snyder, Zach? No. Um, I'll, I'll connect you to him on LinkedIn. Um, he's he's over at Revicon now. He was with a, a team over four. He's he's he spoke on the session earlier. Just just before you guys. Oh, he's still here. Um, Michael, that's a great question. Um, so. How do we better introduce these capabilities so that we can show the impact to missions? Um, you mean like what, you know, using kind of like an ecosystem like ours and what chat ops would do for you? Like, how do you, how do you tell that story at every mission? 
Can we go to these more in the third session? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's a great question. I think that's something that we're trying to work on here also. Um, and that's a big Air Force initiative is like, how do you measure the success of a team, right? And so you hear a lot of different, um, there's different strategies to that. There's Dora metrics, there's all these other things. Um, and uh, personally, like, I think the way that you track that is no in the webinar do do you have a happy team right is your team happy because happy teams are productive teams and do you actually know what the value of your app delivers right are you are you tracking what your app does like how many planes does this like get off the tarmac every day or how many crates does this deliver or a lot of the time basic functionality about these applications isn't aggregated which is what i see and so like, I think developing like a best practice for when you build into an app, how it is that you communicate your success. Like that's something that we have to do is like a community. And that's what we're trying to do with our internal apps so that we can show, we can show that to people. Right. I think that's how, I think that's how you do that is you kind of have to build the example. But many don't have a clue on the impacts of K's. Yeah, I mean, so I have a way we could solve that. I mean, we need to get in, like, I think the easiest is you get an operationalized application, right? You put it somewhere and then you throw a grenade at it and it explodes. And then K8 functions on another remotely operating cluster, right? You never see service interruptions. I, I think that's like the, the best an easiest like non-technical explanation that you could give to somebody because you're right how do you sell this stuff like that's the struggle that i go through every day because i'm you know one of our like chief salespeople here at p1 is how how do i convince you to invest in in this program right it's a it's a struggle it's, these are very obscure technical things and how do how do you sell them oh you're on puckboard okay so you're the revacom puckboard people okay okay um <sighs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a chance because you go to someone, they're going to say, hey, my technology works right now, right? Um, why do I need to spend any money on any of this stuff? I run into that every day. Um, and so the problem is they're not compliant. So that's a thread that you can pull, right? Um, these environments that they have aren't compliant. Um, and I think that's important. They're not using zero trust principles, right? They're not following that guidance. They're not using, um, you know, the DevSecOps re reference guide um, at all, right? And so th these environments aren't using the guidance that's been pushed down from the rest of the DOD. And that's kind of, that's kind of the best strategy that I have for kind of interacting with them is like, you're not doing things the way that we're recommending that you do them. And so I personally quickly move on from those kinds of conversations because like, it's such a target rich environment right now that I don't have to deal with them, right? Like if you're not, if you're not a willing participant and you don't want to come with me, I'm not going to drag you with me. Like there's so many people lined up at the door that if you're that person, right, and you don't want to come along for the ride, you, I don't, we don't have time for that right now. Um, and so in my case, that's a blessing. In your case, you have to deal with this like today, and you don't, you don't have a choice. Um, Um, so what is, um, what challenge have you like run into? Like who, like, what is the, what's this, what's the wall that you hit? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Let me, um, let me figure out how to get in there. I'll come over there. Anybody else that's listening to, I'll be in the gather room. So. Uh, if you know how to get in there, we have a P1 space. And so we can go hang out there if you want to hang out.
Okay, cool. I'll see, I'll see you over there, Michael.